have four children. They're kind of naughty, um, but this, just the right amount of naughtiness though. This picture was taken in the 1980s. We built a house in China. I've lived in Beijing for almost 40 years, and we built this house in, in Beijing um, 30 years ago, and we all grew old. My father is 98, my mother is 99, my oldest son is 37 this year. And when I went to China, I was 26 years old, and I helped to open the CBS News Bureau in Beijing. And I worked in journalism for many years. A decade for CBS, and then worked with Italian and German television. And China changed in this period from this place that was desperately poor, a backwater of communist communism, into a, a world power. And it was so astonishing and fascinating to see this happening, transformational change. In, in the world. And I covered really big stories. Uh, China, the collapse of the Soviet Union, international terrorism, Tiananmen. And in doing this, I was always very busy. But it was in 1995 when the World Bank asked me to go to the Lus Plateau. You'll notice I'm still wearing the same clothes. Now, the Lus Plateau is the cradle of Chinese civilization. This is the place where the Chinese race emerged, the largest ethnic group on the planet. And it's named for its soil. Geo the geomorphology of the soil is that glaciers moving in the high Himalayas pulverized the, the granites. Ignatius rocks that came out of the furnace when the earth formed. And then it's the cradle of Chinese civilization, so if you dig in there, you're going to find some really interesting things. Now, this is to the southeast. It's a fully functional system. But when I went there in 1995, the Lis Plateau was completely denuded of vegetation. And I knew that this was the place that the Chinese race came from. And I thought, what? You know, the Chinese race, the largest ethnic group on the planet, comes from a place that looks like the moon? It doesn't make any sense to me. And I had just been covering the, the geopolitical events, really the biggest events in the second part of the 20th century. And I looked at this and I thought, this is more important. This, I, I, I sort of realized I could look through time. And when, when I was looking through time, I could see human history. I could see evolutionary time. And I could see geological time. And actually, the geology was... And, and dysfunction, what I found was I was studying dysfunction and I became kind of obsessive. So my family started thinking I was insane, which uh, was kind of an, a funny thing. Um, but what I found was that the poverty that was there, the kind of misery that was there, and the ecological outcomes, these were closely together, and I also found that the ecology, I think there should be sound, maybe, um, I don't know what's good, um, but um, the ec ec ecology was completely dysfunctional, and so you had this feedback loops, negative feedback loops, aha, <laughs> so, um, and you know, so the feedback loops were just so intense. You had flooding and drought, and you had famine, and you had this incredible heat 
and, and hydrological. This is weird, the, the amounts of sediments you know, and dust storms that really circled the world. And what I, what I started to find out was that this isn't China. This is worldwide, that when agriculture began 10 to 12,000 years ago, it was, it was this kind of Neolithic agriculture. And when you use this kind of agriculture, you disrupt all the natural evolutionary outcomes. And so the, 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 the final thing is you've, you're, you're reducing biodiversity, you're reducing biomass, and you're reducing the accumulation of organic matter. So you're altering photosynthesis, you're altering nutrient release, nutrient uh, recycling, and you're massively altering the infiltration and retention of moisture. And when you do that, and you play that scenario out for 10 to 12,000 years, it's a collapse scenario. And every civilization around the world. So now I've been to 90 countries in all parts of the world, and basically every place <laughs> that followed this trajectory ends up as a desert. And then, you know, the people are like mystified, what happened, you know, God's wrath or something like that. And, and the fact is, they did it. It's cause and effect. It, it, it's a completely understandable phenomenon, but at 10 to 12,000 years ago, the person who did it didn't understand. I call him Og. You know, Og, Og was not the go-to guy, you know, for... Now, now in, in China, they decided, okay, we're going to fix it. You know, I mean, the Chinese are just unbelievable. You have to go to China, meet the Chinese. They're crazy. But, you know, they said, they, they looked at this and they said, okay, well, let's go take care of it, you know? And <laughs> you're thinking, really? <laughs> the idea that you could do something about this was, you know, amazing. So I was asked by the World Bank to, to film this. Now, this is 1995, when, when, when we first went out there, and there's just nothing there. And the next picture is going to transition to 2009. We made a film called Hope in, a, Hope in a Changing Climate about what they were able to do. This is 14 years after they, they started the tra tra transition. And the next one is even better. So what, what we saw was, okay, if you understand this evolutionary process of biodiversity, biomass, and accumulated organic matter, then you get a different result. So it turns out that the landscape represents our consciousness because when, when people are talking about this is the Anthropocene, this is, this is, this is we, our consciousness is being represented in how functional or how dysfunctional the ecological systems are. And, you know, it's partly about um, our consciousness and it's partly about our greed. So I think ignorance and greed, and what we also found was that once you start reversing the system, all the ecological systems become functional. So it's not like the earth is, is dysfunctional, it's human beings who are the problem. So this, this was, and, and as I started to study this, it was, it was odd because I dropped out of college to be a, a, a television cameraman, and then at some point the, the British who were paying for my work, they said, you have to give a lecture to a scientific body. <laughs> And so I did, and it led to all these fellowships. But, but then, what, what's interesting is that I, I started to think about evolution because I was looking through time, and I realized that when the Earth formed, it was a molten rock surrounded by gases that we couldn't breathe. We would call them poisonous gases. But over evolutionary time, it was transformed into a beautiful garden. Now that sounds very familiar because it's, it's the cosmology from Western religious thinking. And it's a photoreactive biochemical process 
that creates this. It's breath. The life is breathing. And it creates, it takes water, nutrients from geologic materials and sunlight, and it transforms it into living matter. And then it evolves, it differentiates and, and speciates into amazing biodiversity that goes up to incredible levels, including sentient beings. And so this is the basis of the atmosphere, the hydrological cycle, the soil fertility, and the biodiversity. These are the systems that are either functional or dysfunctional. And so our understanding of this is of huge importance. And <clears throat> what, what I saw in following this was that the Chinese, representing the, all of human civilization, when they began their agriculture, they just started this collapse scenario. But it's not just the Chinese, it's all the, the civilizations. But here, they chose to make an intervention. And where they made the intervention is the paradigm shift that determines whether we will survive and become sustainable, or whether we will continue on the degradation path to destroy the natural systems we depend on for life. <clears throat> so this was a this was a, a bit of a of a you know uh, understanding, and so. They sent me to Africa. They said, well, you, you have to go to Africa. I got a fellowship to the Rothamsted Research Institute, which was a... Many things that I've seen in Rwanda remind me of some of the things that I've seen in China. The Chinese government was asking this generation and all the generations alive today to change the course of human history to take those denuded, the denuded landscape that they, they had and somehow alter this. This is a letter saying thank you for coming and sharing that. That's nice. Um, but the next letter is a letter that says, okay, we believe you. And we're, we're changing our land use policy laws. And so all our economic development will be based on ecological function. Can you pause for just a moment? Let me just tell you that there is several years, 12 years since I went to Rwanda, and I've been maybe 13 times now. And they began to do this during a period which includes the global recession. They had 8.2% economic growth throughout the period of the, of the recession. And they have food security at a time when there was famine in other parts of, of uh, East Africa. And they're like the most populous, you know, they're a tiny country, it's highly populated. I mean, that's probably why they got to the point of genocide only in the 90s. So this is coming out of a genocide, switching their thinking to ecological function. But the most exciting part of this is that this is the headwaters of the White Nile and the Congo rivers. So when you restore the headwaters of, of great rivers, then you're having an impact on the entire continent. So it works. <laughs> pretty well. This also, there's evidence in, in Ethiopia and other places. Let's go ahead and unpause that. Now, Common Land Foundation was for, maybe pause one more time and I'll, I'll um, so Common Land Foundation was, I gave a speech similar to this one in Sweden in 2009, which led to um, meeting um, um, someone who's been a kind of a patron to me, it's Willem Farida, who's the CEO of the Common Land Foundation. So he hired me to be a, a senior research fellow at the in International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And we created this film, Hope in a Changing Climate. And now he left IUCN to start the Common Land Foundation, where he's gathering monies and 
privately investing large-scale ecosystem restoration. And this is going very rapidly. There are projects in Spain, South Africa, Australia, and about 10 more countries are, are emerging um, for this. And we can see that if, if investment shifts from destructive activities to restoration, and that, that's going to have a huge impact. So I'll, I'll, I, I'm going to let Willem tell us a little bit about this. But in, in having these fellowships, I've been able to go all over the world and look at these systems, and I found that it's always the same, that there are principles. And <clears throat> Willem has emerged as, as yeah. somebody. How are we going to deal with climate change? The talk just goes on and on and on. But yet, here is something that can be done. Yeah. The, the, these, these, especially these man-made deserts, we can turn them into green areas again. It's lots of effort, it's lots of labor, but we have the financial means to do it, and it will sequester, it will be carbon sinks. But we just have to shift our attention to the natural systems. I only know that we have to work fast to get a, a, a model ready for companies, investors, and, and, and states, governments, to restore landscapes. So what I propose is that we go to a system where we have four returns per hectare, and, and that a financial return or an investment return is a logical thing, but there are other three returns. The return of natural capital, or the return of nature, you could say, here. The return of jobs, very important, because we are talking about people who, are, who want to work, or need work, and want to live well. But maybe the most important is return of inspirational capital, or return of inspiration. If you bring the return of inspiration back in the landscape, it will also will bring back a return of meaningfulness in people themselves. So, uh, maybe pause for one second. Um, when I met Willem, the f and I gave this speech in Sweden, he came up to me afterwards and he said, we have to work together for the rest of our lives. And, and I said, um, okay. <laughs> I, I said, okay, but it's not long enough. <laughs> And uh, so this, this concept of the four returns is progress in thinking about value. It's, it's, it's really important to, to consider this because we have valued, okay, go ahead. Um, we, we have valued, um, go ahead and press the, yeah. We have valued uh, things rather than ecological function. And what I've, what I've realized is that everyone has a role to play in restoring ecological function, that we can do this. And what I've been thinking about now is how do you em engage the largest number of people in ecological restoration and understanding these things? And the, the thing that I've come to believe is that we need to do this simply by reducing our impact and practicing, learning how to practice these things. And so if we do this, we can do this in ecosystem restoration camps. So if you, if you I, I really hope that you'll learn about the ecosystem restoration camps movement and join us in, in doing this, because if we all join together, we, the people, can decide what's going on. The governments, the, the international agencies, the large financial interests, I think it's the people who should lead this. And we can do this by living simply and studying and working together. And by doing it, we, we will have a huge effect. Because we're not going to talk this to death. We can't do it on the internet. We have to do it by restoring soil fertility by 
actually lowering our, our impact, and we can't do it by just cold turkey and leave the, the system. We need to practice, and we need to learn how to work together and live together, how to propagate and plant out indigenous and endemic plants to grow soils, and to be really good at this, to be really good at lowering our impact and really good at increasing our, our f ecological function. So we can use some of the best techniques if we, if we, we, we choose to. So there are co-creation methods, there are wonderful technologies, and everybody can be involved. So it, it isn't like you need experts and more science and more, po and more research and more policy changes. We have a duty, a right, and a responsibility to restore the earth now. And I mean, this is South Africa, Mexico, I mean, everywhere in the world we can, we can do this and it will have an enormous impact. And what, what this does is it changes this belief that wealth is coming from things to an understanding that wealth is coming from ecological function, from the systems that provide the soil fertility, the air, the water, the climate regulation. And, you know, this, we need to, to experience this, not talk about this. We need to go to these places. This is where the, the, the great inspiration and the great joy of doing this comes from. And it, if, we, if we understand this and we get to this, you can't forget it. You can't unknow this information. And this has to become the central intention of human civilization. And this is something, this is our ancestors in Africa talking to us over time. We need to experience this. We are connected to them. We're all related to each other. And we're going to pass on. We're just passing through. And we need to, to, to capture this information because the quality of life for all living things in the future will be determined by what we learn. We're, we're stardust. I think the song was kind of played here. Um, so this is, this is where you can find all of my published works. And uh, it's easy to find me if you Google me, although I'm not the kung fu guy and I'm not the kind of weird New York politician guy. And I'm not the, the Fortune 500 guy. So we should have a John Liu club. I'm, I'm, I, haven't, I'm, I haven't contacted them yet. But, you know. um, but I, you know, this, the thought of the ecosystem restoration camps, I'm going to show you uh, something of, of what it's like in Spain. We built the first ecosystem restoration camp in Spain in the high Altiplano, and we're negotiating in Nepal, Kenya, Mexico, and, and the Netherlands, but they have to be worldwide. So it has to be a huge movement. Join this movement. And um, as soon as this goes away, audio. The movement that we're building here together is about bringing back hope. It's about bringing back a purpose in life. The biggest problem exists on our planet Earth now, it's climate change. So as a result, we're facing so many problems, but the solution to them is the same. We start restoring the ecology, the ecosystems. If we apply regenerative techniques to bring it back to life, this is enough to reverse climate change. The purpose of ecosystem restoration camps is to restore land that has been degraded by humans. What we need to do is go to the historically degraded landscapes, which were once the Garden of Eden. Volunteers can come from around the world, or they can be local community members, volunteering five hours a day, helping to restore the planet. We are ecosystem restoration camps. You're not waiting for somebody else to do the work. To join a group that is actually restoring this planet. I quit my studies to come here to do a little bit of service, to give myself to the planet. This is the thing that I wanted to do. This is the tribe that I want to join. Can be a solution 
bigger than the things that I can do. This is where I want to be. This is what I want to be doing. We need to stand up together. We're, we're a new international of green-minded people. It's, it's a viral concept. That's why it's so strong. It starts with one camp. A lot of people go through that camp. They bring the idea home. They may start new camps. We go from a very degraded ecosystem back to a fully functioning ecosystem. Everybody open their eyes and they're like, oh, it's that simple. Desert used to be productive lands and could be made productive again. It is possible to change a landscape from a desert and to completely regreen it so that there's food, water, and, and wildlife in abundance. I think the camp also can teach us that we can live with really simple, eat the food we grow, um, sleep under the stars, and still have our comfort. Camps is, is a simple way. People get closer to the, to the earth, uh, to the ecosystems themselves, and it's, uh, it's easy to implement and it doesn't leave traces. A great place to experiment for scientists, a great place to learn uh, how to grow food, how to become more self-sufficient. Soil is the basis of life. If you have a, a soil that has no life, nothing good can grow from there. Well, by restoring the ecosystem, which involves restoring the soil, adding more organic matter to the soil and more life, uh, that soil will hold the water much longer, will hold much more nutrients, and that way bring back fertility. As we start planting trees, we start taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, we, we start that process of reversing climate change. This area in Spain, for example, is, uh, is one of the most abandoned areas in Spain. Degradation of the, of the ecosystem mirrors in the degradation of society. It's not just about restoring the land, it's also about restoring, restoring the societies, restoring people. With new people coming in and new knowledge coming in, connecting with local. So the, the bakery at the local village has a better business too. Farmers will have an example of how to do things that they can copy on the land. Be um, an inspiration uh, for the region, for other farmers who are here struggling, but also for young people maybe to come back to the land and like see that farming is actually going to be cool. Let's let's kind of bring back the spirit of, of childhood, of game, but of projects, of doing things together. Uh, I think that the, the camp will bring back that possibility of playing like a kid, but with a purpose. So the more that ordinary people like you and me are able to stand up and, and support it, the more momentum that it's going to get. Many initiatives all around the world are popping up. Everybody wants to make a camp now. That's fantastic and that's what we wanted. We wanted to inspire the people to take initiative. You can come to camp. I think that would be a really great option for someone who is available and wants to do something meaningful. They're going to be offering permaculture design courses here. Um, but if you can't come, you can become a member of ecosystem restoration camps by donating 10 euro per month. That's just a really simple way to basically make these camps a reality. We want to restore the earth. We want to live in the beautiful paradise that the earth is. Come to Ecosystem Restoration Camps and make part of the solution. Join other like-minded people who say, yeah, we can do it. We can reverse this biggest problem ever existed. Going back to the ground, uh, getting dirty, getting back to the soil, with love, with joy, with companierismo and camaraderia, uh, is definitely going to make this happen. I hope you'll all join as supporting members. I think the interesting thing about this is the camps themselves need to be distributed, decentralized, self-organizing and self-governing. But we need to have an, a, a network so we can share the technology, ch share the, the designers and the, 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 the leaders of this movement so that everyone has the, the same knowledge around the world. And we're, we're, we can see there's huge amounts of areas where we're being offered land to go and build camps. So 
there are also large, large numbers of people. Imagine the refugees who are fleeing degraded landscapes or the, the migrants who are trying to get to Europe. There's nowhere to go for them. You know, and so the, the homeless people or the, the post-traumatic stress disorder veterans who badly need to heal their, themselves as well as do something meaningful. And, you know, this is the most important, this is the great work of our time. This is what needs to happen for climate regulation. This is what needs to happen for sustainability. And this is what needs to happen to kind of counter the, the vacuousness, the nihilism that, that has crept into the, the society. And have people have fun, have meaning in their lives. So I really hope that you'll, you'll think about this and become supporting members. It's easy. It's not difficult. If you, if you came here by Lyft, then that's a month um, membership, or if you if you bought three cups of coffee this month at Starbucks, or you know, so you know, become members. The more people that we have, if we have a million members in 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 this movement, we'll have camps in every continent. You'll be able to go camping everywhere, and you'll you'll you know, this is the greatest vacation because you can eat organic food and you can treat everyone with equality. And you know, it's, it's just exactly what we, we need now. So I think we have a few minutes to have questions and answers. So please, I'm, I'm here at this moment. So could we pause the video and put up a microphone? Oh, I, somebody has to get a mic. Yeah, here, we can do it. Okay, you're gonna steal. Uh, um, hello, yeah, please. Oh gosh. Okay. I think we can, take, we can probably take all four of those questions if they're short and concise and we have short answers. No problem. Oh. I'm known for my conciseness. Basically, I'm shy. It's very difficult for me to, you know, stand in front of people. My name is Taylor. Um, I'm coming from East Oakland where I'm a far, our garden and nutrition teacher. Um, I'm also a farmer. Um, uh, I am the daughter of freedom fighters and farmers, and um, the idea that you speak of, of this eco-village, um, just wanting to give credit to the indigenous people who lived in that way and that it's not a new idea. Um, or a luxury, or it is, it is a luxury as people are having a really difficult time um, finding land and just having resources where they have clean air and clean water. Um, so I guess my question is this idea of this eco camp or um, whatever people feel comfortable calling it, um, how is this accessible to communities that are directly impacted by the output of greed? These communities that don't have access to clean air, clean water, um, their schools are located near the highways. How does this become accessible when people can't pay $10.99 or whatever the price is a month, but desire to live on live in a place where they're able to heal and have their basic needs met? Okay. Um, you don't have to be a member, a supporting member, to go to camp. The supporting members are people who, who make a decision that they want to support this in order to, to assist everyone. You can go to camp if you want to go to camp. You know, and I, I, I think it's about self-organization and self-governance, so it's not about one person or, or a group of people deciding what happens in local places. What, what I think we're engaged in now is two things. One is recommending to communities all over the world that they should organize and come together, and they should stop talking about transactional econ economics, stop talking about saying, well, let's buy land or the products that we're gonna grow on our, on our land and how much money can we make from this at the farmer's market. It's irrelevant now. The big money and the big need 
is ecological function to re-regulate the climate. And so those people who do this are the most important people on the planet. So we, in the Bible it says, the last shall be first and the meek will inherit the earth. And I think if we, if we choose to stop caring about trying to position ourselves in the, in the corrupt existing system and say, we have a bigger task. We, we have a bigger task to expand our understanding and our consciousness to realize that we are human beings and that we're connected to all life since the beginning of time. It can't be any other way. And our understandings and our decisions decide the fate of all living things in the future and the future of the planet. So, you know, that's where we're at. And I think in terms of very practical things, you have to figure out who, who has power, who has energy, and it's, if it's the people. I, I recommend that you listen to Mish, Mishka today. Uh, I wish I'd put it on the thing. Um, Mishka Higher Heights. It's on the Above the Bones <laughs> album. Um, the first song, Higher Heights, Mishka. Um, people, you have the power. You know, so that, 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 that's it. And talk to me afterwards, because I'm not concise enough. Uh, along, along the lines of the first question, have you done any work on urban eco-restoration camps? We've got vacant lots all over Boston, Cambridge, and everywhere. And I can see just starting a camp with one vacant lot and getting the community involved. There's, there's movements like this in uh, the sustainable cities um, at Tottenham Ham in, in, in the UK and, and others, edible landscapes and, and so on. So that's, that's all good. But I think it's a really, it's a really, it, it's a good thing. And I think, I think urban, you know, that's a discussion. That's up to the local people. I think what we're doing now is we're aggregating the experts around the world. So we have lots and lots of wonderful people who've been working for decades and decades. And so you, if you join this network, you get them. And they are the trainers, and there's a tribe, I'm, I'm certain already, that there's a tribe of people who are called. It is the indigenous people's uh, legend. The people from all over the world, all ethnic groups, will join together to restore the earth. And so, you know, we, we, have, to, we have to do that with the minimum is mutual benefit. There is another level, which is selflessness. This is very hard to achieve, but, you know, <laughs> I would say, you know, if we're, you know, we're going to have to kind of renounce the whole concept of the, the, the kind of capitalist and, and materialistic perspective and say, we're here because we care about everybody in our community. Everybody eats. You don't pull out a wallet to have a meal. So who do I go and look for to get? Talk to me afterwards. And, okay. and there, there's, a, there's an advisory council. There's a supervisory board. There, there are hundreds. And, and there's 16,000 people discussing it on Facebook. Although I, I, I've learned that only old people use Facebook now. So I'm, Hi, I'm Carolyn Finney. I'm the founder of a nonprofit, and we're restoring 15 acres of urban land. And I, um, in Contra Costa County, just uh, east of here, and um, it's. Uh, I want to talk to you about the consciousness because people keep asking us, "What are you doing? You keep putting, fur, uh, you keep putting manure and wood chips. You know, are you crazy? Grow food?" And we're like, "No, you have to restore the soil first. How?" First, so I have two questions about consciousness. How did the Chinese figure out, how did they shift their consciousness to figure out how to restore that land? How did they know how to restore it? And how do we shift the consciousness of our um, farmers and our elected officials? Because right now we're destroying our own country with our agricultural practices. Yeah. Just a small question. <laughs> um. <laughs> Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, I, I've been studying 
and communicating and documenting and communicating about ecological function now for over 25 years. And I've been following you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And what's interesting is there is a change in this period. So, I mean, when I started, I really kind of felt like a lone voice in the wilderness. And it's, you know, I, 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 was, I, I found it odd, but when, when they invited me to speak in scientific venues, so I've spoken at the Royal Society in Britain twice and the Royal Academy in Stockholm and all these places, you know, and I've had fellowships to prestigious universities and institutes. And, you know, I, I felt it was odd. I, actually, there's a funny story because I, I was given a fellowship in Rothamsted and I had to give the lecture to the, the in their, like, science lecture hall. And this relatively well-known scientist came up to me and he said, you seem to know what you're talking about. <laughs> and, and I said, well, thank you, that's, that's nice. And, and then he said, if you can understand it, everyone can understand it. <laughs> and, and, and I said, yeah, that's the, the good. You know, it's kind of a, not necessarily a wonderful um, uh, thing, but let's talk about this offline because I want to hear the other people, the other questions, and I'll, I'll talk to you. So are you going to tell us how China came to this epiphany to restore and how they knew what to do? Um, I'll, I'll tell you l later, offline. but, but okay. China, you know, Ch Chinese are quite clever, you know, so, you know, that's why I was able to learn English by listening to the Voice of America on the radio. You know? <laughs> Asians are rapid, you know, click, you know. No, 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 please, let, let them, just ask your questions. Okay, one, okay, one minute, ask your questions and I'll tell you, answer them afterwards. Thanks for coming up today, I, I love this. But I, I just had a quick question about, also about China and, and about that process um, in terms of what the big challenges were, um, because obviously we see the great success of it, but, but also for us who work in the space to understand that. Uh, my question has to do with, um, the work around the world to abate vegetation uh, along rights of way. And I've witnessed 30% um, of, of uh, herbicide usage in uh, public lands being focused on uh, rights of way, uh, vegetation control, and, and how it's decimating, like creek sides and roadside. And I just wanted to see, and this is mostly, of course, urban, and I, I just wanted to see uh, if there's any way to connect the work of this organization with this problem we have throughout the world in vegetation control. Thank you. My wife and I are members. How many of you are members? Okay. Hey! Well, the ecosystem restoration camps. I challenge all of you who have the funds, who can afford you know, to get here by lift to become a member of the Ecosystem Restoration Camps and contribute. This is the exciting activity of our generation. And I really thank you, John, for giving us this vision and giving us hope. And I encourage all of the young people who don't have uh, firm roots and don't know where you're going, go to one of these camps and learn this incredibly valuable lessons. Usually, you know, for uh, uh, PDC, you gotta pay 1200 bucks. You know, you, you get free food, you get uh, camaraderie. Go for it, thank you.